Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's uh, weekly intelligence insights uh, briefing. I'm Ross Hill, Director of Intelligence with At Risk Global Risk Intelligence Team. I'm here with intelligence analysts Roman Fisher and Cooper McGill, and we're going to run through some of the things we think are important or interesting for this week. I'm firstly going to pass you over to Roman Fisher. Thank you, Ross. Extremists use firearms more than any other weapon, and over the past decade, shootings have accounted for 75% of all deaths caused by extremists. A recent report by the Anti-Defamation League shows that extremists overwhelmingly use guns to carry out their attacks. The ADL Center on Extremism documented 187 incidents from 2012 to 2021 in which extremists used firearms. During these incidents, extremists killed 325 people and wounded 252. To determine the most used and deadliest firearm types, the ADL grouped attacks by incidents in which uh, the extremists used a handgun, an assault rifle, a shotgun, or a non-military style rifle, or multiple weapons. Uh, to determine the number of casualties by weapon type, the ADL also calculated the number of people killed or wounded in each incident. Their numbers break down uh, as following, averaging uh, 5.4 fatalities per incident. The deadliest attacks are those where multiple weapons are used. Of the 22 reported incidents, 119 people were killed and 122 were wounded, uh, accounting for 42% of all casualties. Notably, 14 of the 22 multiple uh, weapon attacks involved extremists engaged in ideological driven attacks um, against their perceived enemies. The ADL report shows that there were 19 incidents in which, in which the extremists used a single assault rifle. In all, 62 victims were killed and 60 more were wounded, <clears throat> averaging 3.26 fatalities per incident. The high average of fatalities per incident is largely because of two significant uh, events, the 2019 Walmart mass shooting in El Paso, Texas, and the 2018 school shooting in Parkland, Florida. In more than half of all attacks, extremists used a single handgun, counting for 101 fatalities, uh, equaling an average of 1.04 deaths per incident. Uh, handgun incidents are less lethal compared to attacks where multiple weapons or, or a single assault rifle is used. However, despite the lower fatality average, handguns represent the most common firearm used in an extremist attack. Uh, next, uh, I will hand you off to Cooper McGill. Cooper? Thank you, Roman. Uh, so recently, a, a pro-China influence campaign, a campaign that has been going on for uh, several years now, actually, has been more uh, recently utilized to target uh, a number of rare earth mining companies. Uh, these are companies that are predominantly located in Australia, Canada, and the United States. Uh, the campaign has utilized a network of inauthentic accounts across uh, a range of social media platforms uh, in an attempt to instigate protests, uh, boycotts, etc. Uh, these inauthentic accounts have been used to lodge complaints, uh, provide doctored photos of uh, individuals that appear to be protesting the uh, the organizations that are being targeted by this campaign in an effort to make it look as though there's a uh, you know widespread uh, outrage or complaints against these organizations uh rare earth mining companies are of a pretty strategic importance to china uh both uh, economically and just politically in the way uh the industry fits uh into the world stage and the dominance that China currently has in the industry. Uh, so in this case, these are organizations being targeted uh, that could provide uh, significant competition uh, to China, to Chinese companies. Uh, in this case, the campaign was uh, largely unsuccessful. Uh, none of the posts, there were you know quite a number of posts, but none of them received significant uh, engagement online uh, in a way that appeared to lead to any sort of, uh, you know, protests or boycotts, uh, at least as far as authentic ones go. Uh, however, this illustrates 
uh, you know, a great example of the risk of dis and misinformation campaigns. Uh, the risk remains incredibly high uh, going forward for corporations, their executives, et cetera, whether it be, you know, such as in this case from a uh, nation state actor uh, or from other uh, corporations within their same competitive space. Uh, the risk will just continue to grow uh, as time goes on and social media and the internet is exploited for these purposes. And now I will pass you over to Ross Hill. Thanks, Cooper. Uh, so we've had uh, an extremely large data leak related to Uber. Uh, 124,000 confidential documents were leaked to journalists. Uh, they cover a five-year period, which is 2013 to 2018. And that's when Uber was run by its co-founder, Travis Kalanick. Uh, the data includes direct WhatsApp and email messages between him and other executives. And there's really a lot to unpick. Um, so we can probably expect stories is to start appearing uh, over the coming days and weeks. We've already kind of started to see them be kind of drip fed um, into the news outlets. Um, but some of the things they've been accused of are lobbying several politicians and other influential individuals. Uh, the main one appears to be Emmanuel Macron, the French president. Uh, he seems to have told the company that he had brokered a secret deal with its opponents in the French cabinet when Uber was trying to enter the market in France. Uh, this is while Macron was economy minister. Um, and then at the same time when Uber was trying to enter the French market, there were lots of protests uh, from uh, taxi drivers and Kalanick apparently ordered French uh, executives of the company to retaliate by encouraging Uber drivers to stage counter protests uh, with civil dis disobedience. Uh, it also seems that Uber knew that they were operating illegally in a lot of jurisdictions and they actually developed a kill switch so that if an Uber office was raided, uh, access to the company's main data systems was able to be cut off and that would uh, prevent the authorities from gathering evidence against the company. And that was actually reportedly used at least 12 times uh, in France, Netherlands, Belgium, India, Hungary and Romania. Uh, although Uber has obviously sought to distance itself from these allegations, uh, one of those believed to have been involved, uh, an executive called Pierre Dimitri Gorkotti, uh, he ran Uber's uh, operations in Western Europe uh, at the time, he now runs Uber Eats and sits on the company's executive team. So even though they're trying to distance themselves, uh, they've got people still allegedly kind of involved in, in what happened. Um, so we may see some uh, investigations into Uber uh, and, and into others. Uh, it's going to be particularly damaging for Emmanuel Macron, uh, recently re-elected as French president, but then losing control of the French parliament. So things slightly politically difficult for him maybe um, but the one thing really it, it highlights is uh, the scrutiny of kind of company and executive behavior uh, where you know you have all stakeholders around the company expecting uh, that company to kind of share their values and so any allegations of, of kind of wrongdoing increase the things of insider risk you know releasing uh, damaging information of some kind. Uh, that's it from us this week. We hope you found the information useful and we hope to see you again soon.